Yes, Friday we will get to talk again at the bonfire, but this is the, the last regular chapel message this year for me to speak to you guys. And I just want to say thank you to you as well. Um, I appreciate what Randy said, but also I, I appreciate you guys being here, listening and uh, thinking and interacting, growing in your faith. Uh, the church is such an amazing thing. We can all grow together, learn from one another, be inspired and challenged by each other as we grow closer to Christ. And... I appreciate what you guys have done this week because not only have you given me the chance to share a little bit with you, but throughout the day, throughout the week, I've heard so much from you guys that's been uh, exciting and challenging and, and just enjoyable for me to hear and to see in your life as Christ is growing and working in you. And the amazing thing that changes our lives we know as believers, is the gospel. It is truly amazing and there is nothing else like it. And one of the reasons we love the gospel as believers is because it means that God is hands-on, that he's active in our lives. When we think about the good news that that Jesus didn't just look down from heaven and see us in our our struggles, but he actually came down near to us to be active, to work, to do great things here, to make a way for us. We get to be present where God is working because of the gospel. And in fact, our hearts, our lives, end up being ground zero for his power to be shown. One of the most famous verses talking about this is Philippians 1.6. And it simply says, I'm certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. And I think that that is an incredibly inspiring promise. It's such a great truth. God will finish what God started in us. It's something that we can rely on. It's something that we can build our lives on, knowing for sure. Knowing for sure that God will finish what he started in us. And we can be grateful for that. We can praise God for that, and many of us do, except for there's one little issue there. For many of us, the good news doesn't always feel so good anymore. And that might seem strange to say, and so I just want to talk about a little dig in. Why might it not? And I think one of the reasons many of us in this room, not people out there somewhere else, but many of us... Don't feel that the good news is so good anymore is because God's work in us, God's good work in us, often is hard. It's challenging, it's painful, it's difficult. The way that he works in our lives doesn't always feel good. He is changing things, and a lot of us are people who don't like it when people change things around us, and we like it even less when people change things in us. Consider this well-known passage from the beginning of Romans 12. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's a lot in there, and we could talk about uh, that passage. We could have talked about it for this whole week and beyond this whole summer and beyond. But one of the things I just want to point to is this idea that what happens as far as us becoming more like Christ as his people is he transforms us. He changes us into new people. It's amazing, but I want you to consider this simple truth. God's love will not let you stay like you are. God loves you as you are, but he's not going to let you stay like you are. And maybe when you first came to know Christ or for for quite some time, you celebrated the gospel because of God's hands-on activity in your life, working in you, changing you, showing you things, teaching you, molding your character in ways that, that you thought were great. We were ground zero for him to exercise his power in us, to save us. But often, the truth is, we want God's hand to be for us, but we don't like it when God puts his hands on us. 
We want his hand to support us. We want God to be with us and to comfort us, but we don't always want God to do his work in us because we know the truth because of how broken we are, because of who we are. When God works, it just might hurt. It just might be hard. It might not be what we want. We struggle as Christ followers with the truth that the Bible communicates that you do not belong to yourself. For you were bought with a high price. And we read in Romans 12 that we shouldn't let the world, you know, squeeze us into its mold is the idea there. We shouldn't let the world shape us into what it wants us to be. And many Christians are cool with that idea. We like that idea. I'm not going to let the world shape me. I'm not going to let the world tell me who to be. But the reason that we're okay with that is because we want to be who we want to be. And so when we hear the reality that God wants to transform us, this causes a big problem. Because God's word says that we should let him transform us, that we should let him shape us, that we should let God take away who we once were and create something new in us. But for you, Christian, recognize this. God is going to shape your life. And it can be very difficult. For the disciples... When they followed Christ, all kinds of struggles occurred. Some lost their jobs. They had distance from their family and friends. Most of them had a difficult life, persecution, pain, even death for most of them. It's difficult to think of a God who would do that, who would allow people who choose to follow him to go through these hard things. But I want you to be encouraged to know that just because something is hard doesn't mean that that thing is bad. Just because something is hard doesn't mean that that thing is bad. And for you, someone who's following Christ, God may knock you down if you're standing on a foundation that's apart from Him. He may knock you down if you're running away from Him. And He just might lead you where you don't want to go. He might lead you away from comfort, away from that one relationship that you want, away from popularity, away from whatever you desire so strongly. And this is where we often lose perspective, because when God doesn't give us what we want, we think that there's something wrong with him. We think that he's taking away what's best from us as if we know better than he knows. We think that when God says no to us, that he's holding us back. Or when he says, don't go there or don't live like that, we start to think that God is our enemy. Now, you might struggle with that thought. It's not like a normal uh, thing for someone who's a follower of Christ to consider. Do, Do I think that God is my enemy? And we might even recoil from that thought because it sounds really unholy. But many of us here really are in that place where we consider God truly to be our enemy. That guy who tells us what to do. That guy who makes me uh, do things I don't want to do. That guy who holds me accountable for the things that I do do. Whatever it might be, we think that God is against us. And because we think of God as our enemy, we often fight against him. And we really need to think about what's happening here for us as believers. Um, Because he is working in our lives, we consider him our enemies and we fight against him. That's crazy. Because God is actually working to make us more like him and he uses uh, difficult things often to shape us or he, he turns us away from our old life into a new life, because God is active, because God is transforming us, A lot of times the way that we respond is by thinking that he is against us because we don't want to do those things. And then the very God who saves us and the very God who's doing things for our best, we consider to be our enemy. This is where pride and trust in God collide together. We know that Jesus said that he came to give us life to the fullest, the best possible life that we could ever have. At the same time, if we fight against his transforming work, what we're doing is we're doubting that promise. And we do so because of pride and lack of trust, and we can see that in a couple of different ways. In pride, we think that we know best, and if God is not doing what we want, 
he's not doing what's best. I know that I felt like that. If God's not going according to my plan, he must be off. That's a lot of pride. Our trust in him is coming apart when we think that. When we see God putting us through some hard things in our life, and we all go through different kinds of hard things, and we start to doubt that God really wants our best, we doubt his love, his kindness towards us, because how could a kind God make my life so harsh? We doubt his love and kindness towards us, and we think that we know better than he does, that we shouldn't have to deal with this, that we shouldn't have to go through this. And when this happens, our lack of trust in him, our lack of trust in his goodness, leads us back towards pride again, and it just cycles around. Lack of trust leads to pride, and pride leads to lack of trust. And whatever the case might be, we end up fighting God based on a lie. We end up believing, based on our own faults, lack of trust and pride, that God is in the wrong when really it's us. Hard. We go against what he shows us is best for our lives. But I want to tell you something that you already know. You just might not actually believe or live out. And that is that God is not your enemy. God is not your enemy. We need to stop fighting him. Because this is not a battle that we can win. And this is not a battle that we would ever want to win. He's not our enemy. Listen to the words of the prophet Hosea. Speaking to his people, he says, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces. Now he will heal us. He has injured us. And now he will bandage our wounds. In just a short time, he will restore us so that we may live in his presence. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him. He will respond to us as surely as the arrival of the dawn or the coming of the rains in early spring. O Israel and Judah, what should I do with you, asks the Lord? For your love vanishes like the morning mist and disappears like the dew in the sunlight. I sent my prophets to cut you to pieces, to slaughter you with my words, with judgments as inescapable as light. I want to show you love. I want you to show love, not offer sacrifices. I want you to know me more than I want burnt offerings. But like Adam, you broke my covenant and betrayed my trust. It's amazing all that that we see here and what, what is being said here in the Old Testament could apply perfectly to many of our lives now. And the reality is God's word does for us exactly what he talks about it and doing to the people of Israel and Judah then that the word of God can cut us to pieces that oftentimes the truth the reality of who God is and, and how we interact with him shows our lives that we've broken his covenant and betrayed his trust that even as his, as his people that he has chosen and even as his people that he loves we don't trust him And the issue is diagnosed here with great clarity. He says that our love vanishes so easily that we betray God's trust. That even though he he wants us to show him love, and even though he wants what's best for us, we struggle with that relationship. He wants to be so near to us, and yet when he doesn't do the things that we want him to do, oftentimes we don't actually want to be near to him. As people who know God, we drift away. It's so common for us to let our relationship with God suffer because of our wandering. Because we want what we want more than we actually want God. But God wants to be close to us. God wants to mold us. He wants to lead us in the best ways. And he wants our best. And he defines that best by saying, I want you to know me. I want you to be close to me. Like what we talked about with David, the key here is closeness to God. God wants us to be near him, and if there are things that come between us, he will break those things off. 
because he loves you. You hear that? God wants you to be near him, and he will do what is necessary to finish the work that he started in you, even if it means he has to break things off between us. If we try to run away, a loving God may break our legs. Not because he hates us, not because he is our enemy, but because he knows that if our legs carry us away from him, they lead us away from the God who gives every good thing and the God who is the only good thing for us. If you guys have a Bible, you can turn to Psalm chapter 63. This is a Psalm of David, and it's a really amazing prayer where David gets into this subject of being near to God. It's inspiring, it's challenging, and it is so good for me to hear. This is what it says. Oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you. In this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night, because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. The amazing passage talking uh, to God from David's own heart saying, God, there is nothing that I want more than to be close to you. He's essentially saying, God, I want you. I need you. I'm longing for you. And if I'm not close to you, my soul will die of thirst your love is better than, li- than life itself. Nothing in this world is like you. Nothing I have known or can ever know is worth as much to me as being near to you. You are the only thing that can satisfy me. So you dominate my thoughts. I can't get you out of my mind. All other things, achievements, relationships, recognition, comfort, whatever it might be, They are all hollow and empty when I compare them to being near to you. And I'm going to cling to you and be glad that your hand holds on to me. When I read what David says here, it is such a big challenge. This idea, God, your love, who you are, my relationship with you, you are better than life. So why does David feel this way? Why is he so confident in this? that God can ultimately satisfy him like nothing else. There's only one causal statement in this section that we read. There's only one reason that David gives for feeling this way. And he says, all of this is true because God is his helper. This is how David fights the lie that God is is his enemy. He fights the lie that God is his enemy by recognizing the truth, that God is actually his helper. Do you think David wanted to go through everything that God put him through? Hiding in caves, assassination attempts, people chasing him down, having to act like he had some sort of mental or physical handicap to escape from people? Probably not. Do you think that he was comfortable with all the places that God led him? Certainly not. But he trusted in who God actually is. God is our helper. You see, we can be tempted to think that God is our enemy when we have believed that he actually wants to harm us, to keep something back from us, to rob us. But David sees the truth, that God isn't trying to harm us. He is actually helping us. But note this, when we say that God is your helper, the Bible does not mean to say, and I do not mean to deceive you by allowing you to believe that that means that God is your assistant. God is wise, he is good, he knows best, but it's like a wise surgeon who will cut you to save you. God will break you to bring you close, and he loves you too much 
to see you just run your life into the ground. He loves you too much to see you waste yourself on other things. He loves you too much to see you seek satisfaction in things that will leave you empty ultimately. So stop fighting and start really trusting and following in a God who is your helper. Allow God to shape you. Allow God to break you away from all the things that hold you back. Allow God to grind off all the things that cause friction with him. Stop fighting against the surgeon who is wise enough to know that he has to cut you to save your life. Trust him, even when it hurts. Because when God does something that's painful, he does it for our good. When he calls you to come and die, he is not your enemy. Didn't he come and die for you? When he calls you to be persecuted, he is not your enemy. Wasn't he mocked and spit on for you? And when he doesn't let you get comfortable, he is not your enemy. Wasn't he homeless? Wasn't he misunderstood and hated in order to give you a home and the deepest love? Our God is not here to harm us, but to help us. And he will finish the work that he has started in you. So don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. And don't think that when God is transforming you, it's difficult and it's painful and it's hard, that it's because he doesn't love you. The reality is the contrary. He is doing that because he cares about you so deeply. And the challenge for us is to truly trust him, to set our pride aside and to say, God, you know best. I'm going to love you and I'm going to draw close to you. I'm going to follow you and I'm going to be all yours. And when the situation is great and you bless me and I see it, I will praise you. And when things are hard and when I think that things are falling apart and things are too much for me, I'm going to trust you because things are not too much for you. Are you trying to fight God instead of trying to follow him? Are you seeing God as your enemy instead of as your helper? Today is a time for us to repent, to change our attitude, to seek God to give us a new heart, to be like David where we can say, God, you are mine. And I so desperately and honestly want you. I'm thirsty for you. Every part of me wants you. There's not one part of my life that's going in another direction. I've seen you, and I am in awe. I am in absolute awe. Your unfailing love is better than life itself, and because of that, I will give you praise. And that praise for us will be demonstrated through our trust in you. Because I recognize you will satisfy me more than the richest feast. You are my helper. You love me. And so I will cling to you. And I know that your strong right hand holds me securely. Trust in the Lord. Believe that his plans for you are good. And when he is working in your life and when he is working on you, don't assume that it's the angry hand of an angry God. But the loving hand of a God who's willing to do what is necessary to save you from following yourself. Let's pray. God, we love you, and we desperately want to love you more. We ask that you would just put such a great desire in us to be close to you. God, expose, expose in our hearts the lie that we believe when we choose to think that other things will satisfy us more than you. God, expose in our hearts the lie that we believe when we think that because you lead us through hard times, you lead us through bad times. God, 
Help us to truly be confident that you are always good, that you have our good in mind, and that you are our wise helper who will do whatever it takes to bring us close to you. We know that you will hold us with your strong right hand. Help us to cling to you as well. It's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. Thank you guys so much.